every moment in the teaching career. Uh, this is one of the stranger ones, because, wow. Wow. So many fantastic, fantastic speeches. And weirdly enough, part of this job is very much wanting the young people in our care to be better than us, outgrow us. You lot seem to have done it a little bit faster than I'm comfortable with, and going last, now I'm nervous. But let's see where we can go with it. So, um, I wanted to talk about who's teaching our children, because in my career, I've noticed that, that it's not always the people we think it is, and it's not always the methods that we think it might be. I came to teaching from a professional career in business, and I decided I was going to be an ICT teacher because of my experience. Being an ICT teacher, I had to learn about how to teach you safety. That meant looking after all of you and making sure that you hopefully didn't make any faux pas on the internet that got you in a lot of trouble. So, there's me, fairly early on in my career, sat in a classroom talking about paedophiles. <laughs> Bear with me. And as we're talking about this, and I'm talking about the, the frenzy male abuses, a young man in front of me says, puts his hand up, yes, he says, we're all right then. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean, we're all right then. He said, well, you just said that most, most of the online predators are male, and we're boys, so we're fine then. I went, actually, I hate to tell you this, but very large proportion of, of those who are abused are in fact male. Oh, that's quiet. Conversation carries on around the room as one would expect. His hand creeps up again. With due trepidation, I say, yes. He says, how does a man have sex with a boy? At which point, someone over on that side of the room goes, he sticks his up his, no, 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 no. Stop talking, stop talking. You, um, I don't, oh, no idea how I was going to answer this one. So I decided to defer to the previous head of PSAG and say, you can go and talk to her, and you and I are having a conversation at break time. In that moment, I discover that I have one child who knows the literal ins and outs of things that perhaps we would hope you shouldn't, and another one who has only just found out that perhaps boys might like boys. Both of these young men were 11 years old at the time. What lives had they led that took them to this place? How did they end up believing that? And how was the difference so strong? My break time interaction told me at least part of it. This young man knew so much because he had A, older brothers, and B, the internet. It's kind of a recurring theme. We did some research asking uh, students at the school, who do you think is primarily responsible for teaching you about things like sex? And the students said, primarily, they thought the school was responsible. Good, you might think. We asked parents the same question. Parents all believed they were the ones who had primacy in this particular bit of teaching. So already we've got this disparity between what the adults in their lives think is going on and what the students think is actually going on. But then it goes a step further. See, then we ask them, who do you actually learn from? It's a little bit different. At this point, whilst quite a few of them still said school, the majority actually said friends, the internet, and parents came a very distant, excuse me, a distant last. Now, you've got to ask yourself some important questions here as well. Where are the friends finding out what it is they're telling each other too? Because I'm pretty sure it's not all coming from practical experience. So, once again, it turns out that the internet is our culprit. We suffer, societally, from a thing that I would call euphemistic teaching, where people don't really want to fully express the idea around something because it's a little bit risky or difficult and so they don't want to say the words. You might, if you want an example of this, look to when you're young, what do people call certain body parts? Do they call them by the technical names? Are they said with no shame? Or are they given some strange euphemistic names that aren't even close? Or is it slang? 
why not use the proper words? Well, it turns out this isn't really because of the discomfort of the child. Because a child, a word is a word. Easy version. Um, look, look, little Johnny, it's a bow wow. It's a dog, right? It was a dog before you started, it'll be a dog later. Why teach the word bow wow and then teach the word dog later on? You might as well just say it's a dog. But people don't want to use this language. Now, don't make a mistake here. The discomfort is not yours, young people. It's the discomfort of the adult involved in the conversation at this point who really, really doesn't like the scenario or doesn't want to say. The danger of euphemistic teaching is it tends to leave unanswered questions. It tends to leave little voids that somebody else needs to fill. When people sit down for that conversation and dad leaves the room, I'm going, yeah, I've had a good talk with him, he knows what's what now. And the poor person is sat in the room going, I have no clue whatsoever. Because the conversation wasn't real. It was filled with euphemisms, half ideas, partially spoken. So who then fills that space? Who's going to talk about it? Now, if the parents aren't talking about it, and goodness forbid, teachers actually giving that much information. I mean, we're great with physiology, of course. Science and biology lessons, physiology, easy. Some of the other stuff's a bit more difficult. And a lot more complicated, as it turns out, when you try the practical application. So, um, who's going to help teach for that? Very dry mouth, sorry. So, I'll give you an example of a poorly learned lesson, but a completely unintentional one. We often learn from modelling, particularly when we're very young. We observe what other people do, and we think that must be the way that it should be done. Assuming that we're watching someone that we actually credibly put in that position of the person that we want to learn from, then they're showing us the way it should be. Try this example on the side. You've just had Sunday tea. Grandma's been around to visit. It's the end of the day. Grandma's going home now. And you're told, Grandma's going now. Give her a big hug and a, hug and a kiss goodbye. And the small child goes, No, I don't want tea. The parent goes, No, 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 you, you, you need to go and give Grandma a kiss, hug and a kiss goodbye. No, I don't want to. Well, you've got to go and give Granny a hug and a kiss goodbye. She'll be really upset if you don't, because she loves you. Do I really have her? Go and give your grandmother a kiss goodbye. What lesson has this young person just learned? Have they learned about familial love? Have they learned about good conduct? Or have they just learned that their choices, their body autonomy, who they touch, who they kiss, is down to whether or not the other person will be upset if they don't? And yet this is one of the first lessons on consent that people end up teaching. I'm sure nobody thinks it through that way. But it's still the effect that it has. If we're not explicit with our young people, if we don't meet them where they are, with the language that they use, and talk to them about the problems they actually have, how are we going to make a difference? I've ended up in conversations numerous times with people who will tell me about their childhood and their schooling, and I sometimes have to politely remind them, that was 50 years ago, times have changed. One of those biggest changes, and perhaps the most profound one is, of course, that when they were young, if you really wanted to go and find out about stuff, you had to hope that the book you needed was in the library. Now, we have the internet, we have devices, and the entirety of the world's knowledge is available through that little thing you're carrying around in your pocket. So, if people are not teaching and meeting in those gaps, the internet's going to do the teaching for us. I've had interesting conversations with young people where I'm saying, no, you shouldn't go up to young women in the street and just start talking to them or asking for their phone number. It's not necessarily something that they want. And they'll respond with, yeah, but there's this guy on TikTok who goes up to women and, and they like it, and therefore it's a good thing. 
Well, where's the rest of the information? Where are all the times when he did exactly that and it didn't go well? Where are all the times where someone told him not to? Where are all the times where the other person actually looked, sounded or appeared afraid? In some of the lessons I teach, I'll get a, a young woman who's a member of staff to come along and talk to this voice as well and say about the experiences that she's had personally in such scenarios. When asked by a boy, how does she feel when people come up and do that? And she responded, scared, sometimes terrified. It was incomprehensible for this young man that what he was doing couldn't be a good thing. He had no way of knowing. Because the things he was consuming kept on telling him that actually it was okay. Who's giving the lessons? If it's not parents, and it's not teachers, where are we learning from? Take it a step further. Meme culture. Now, I'm sure people in the room love their memes, especially the dank ones, obviously. But meme culture is largely reductive. It takes complicated ideas that are much bigger than the couple of lines they might fit in, and boils it down to something easy to swallow. Memes are like a form of mini propaganda. If you keep hearing enough of it that says, the cer says certain things, eventually it seeps in. And bit by bit by bit by bit, we change our position. We move a step closer to another ideal. It's no coincidence that there are white supremacist groups out there that have actually stated that they are actively using meme culture to try and shift that midpoint for our young people, to try and help radicalize our young people. Because they know it works. Simple ideas, often repeated, strong effect. Now, if we go back to the idea of sex education, if we're not teaching it, where are people learning about sex? And the truth is, pornography is the primary form of sex education for our young people. But pornography isn't real. It's largely extreme and contains acts which most people would not consider reasonable in the normal sex life that they have. But we don't teach that. Parents, I'm fairly sure don't teach that. And as long as we're leaving that space open, the internet will continue to do so. The internet thrives on things that are extreme. It thrives on extreme politics. It thrives on exciting ideas. And it thrives on giving you something unusual. Because boring in the middle doesn't generate clicks. And clicks generate money. You can see it in politics. You can see it in news articles. It's always the most exciting person who gets the most interest. Think about how much time Donald Trump was spending in our headlines versus Joe Biden now. Trump was exciting in the sold newspapers. So what are we going to do about all of this if we can't be there or teach those direct lessons? Here's a strong thought. In order for our young people to be best able to go out into that world and face it, we need to give them the right tools to translate what it is that they are seeing, to understand what it is they are being told, to dissect it for what it is, and take the right lessons from it. Because we're not going to be there with them when they're experiencing it. That particular idea is a truism for all education. We're trying to build the foundation on which our young people are then able to springboard forward and get what they need out of the world. Look at the presentations we've had. Was that stuff that was definitely taught in lessons? Or did our young people go away with the skills that they have? Research, learn, expand, grow. That's what we want. The internet is neutral. It's not good, it's not evil. Even social media. 
It's not necessarily good or evil. It's what we choose to do with it that becomes the issue. So, for all of us to think, who are we going to be? What sort of language are we going to use that those around us can model a better way forward? Are the words we use phobic? Are the words not equal? Do we accidentally carry sexism or racism in certain attitudes and behaviours without even realising it because we haven't examined our choices? Or because the latest funny meme said a funny thing and we want to send it on or share it without really interpreting what we've seen? Everyone can make a difference in this. Positive use of language, positive examination of what is real, and above all, conversations with young people that are rooted in the reality that they are living, not the one that we might desperately wish was the truth, but the one that they're actually facing. And if we can do that, we will give them the right tools, and they will have the right methods, and maybe we won't need to be so afraid of the internet anymore. Maybe instead we can take the best of it and push away the worst. Thank you very much. Thank you.